My name is Chris Pearson, and I wanted to thank uh, the, the Perfusion.com organization for, for organizing the meeting. Heard some outstanding presentations earlier today, and uh, appreciate the opportunity for, to provide an overview uh, for the group. You'll hear Fresenius Medical a fair amount, uh, and uh, the, the, uh, the focus of, of, of our company uh, at Fresenius used to be having a tough time advancing these. Not sure it's about that, a bit, a bit of a false start. Anyway, uh, Fresenius Medical Care, it, it, as, you, as you may be aware, it is, has a large dialysis presence in healthcare. Uh, that's, that's one element of the company. Uh, the other element uh, of the company is, is what Fresenius has been working on for about the last decade, and that's expanding our portfolio beyond renal. So uh, we, we have made some, some very uh, conscious efforts to, ex to extend and advance beyond renal, specifically the heart and lung uh, area, as well as other multi-organ system failure. So Fresenius is an umbrella company. Uh, we are going through a bit of a transformation, which is exciting, uh, but within that umbrella company, we've got the heart and lung division of, of Zinios uh, that we refer to as Noble Lung in the U.S. Uh, I'll also speak to uh, briefly our ongoing commitment to product development. Uh, in terms of, of our vision, we, we really are looking beyond the organ. We're looking at, at the quality of life. We're looking at the overall care uh, within, within patients that, that find their way into the, into the ICU that have multi-organ system failure, and we're doing this globally. I'll get to that in a bit of a second. Um, in addition, as we look at healthcare and, and the economical challenges, the clinical challenges, uh, we're looking at, at bringing the simplest and safest um, methods or, or therapies uh, into the market. And we've started this in Germany with Zinios recently, and we're, we're just starting off in the U.S. In terms of our, our, our care model, and, and uh, you, know, in, you know, what this kind of matters or, or means to you, the, the organization ha has a significant amount of, um, of, of assets and, and uh, resources that we're, that we're stepping back and saying, okay, where do we apply these in the ICU? Uh, and we're squarely looking at the heart and lung space uh, and, uh, and across, you know, all all, uh, all organs, but we're, we're squarely focused on, on heart and lung, and you'll start to see that in the U.S. more frequently. In terms of Zinios, uh, this is the company that, that Fresenius acquired, and, and just a bit of history, just in terms of, of who we are. I think that's probably the important starting point. And um, Zinios was, was uh, acquired by Fresenius Medical Care within Within Zinios, Zinios launched into the U.S. in 2020. Um, it was right in the in the January time period in 2020, which coincided, uh, you know, imperfectly or perfectly with COVID. So it, right now we're we're sitting uh, in a position where where while we rolled out and we received approval and we were we were excited about that. We're the only clear device uh, uh, for, for, uh, for ECMO in the U.S. We, we were kind of put on hold for about the, the, the last two and a half years. So attending these meetings, being able to have an opportunity to share what the broader Fresenius is, is, is really a pleasure. And we were focused on, on doing this a couple of years ago. 
Uh, we're expanding into into the U.S. now, and we've we've got uh, we're in a number of centers of excellence, including West Virginia University. Uh, I'm not sure if if folks had a chance to hear Dr. Hayenga's presentation a few moments ago, but we're we're proud to to be uh, part of the care team in some of the universities that are providing the best the best care. In terms of, of what our footprint looks like, we're, we're very focused uh, in, in, in the Zinnius headquarters, which is in Germany. Uh, we've got a medical center that, that has been working with uh, thousands of, of uh, patient runs. Uh, we've had over 15,000 ECMO patient runs uh, over, the, over the last decade. Uh, and, and we've got a data repository at, at, uh, at, at Reinigan University. Heilbronn is where we're headquartered. In terms of the employees, the Zinios group, including the U.S., has over 300 employees. We've got uh, 14 uh, countries that we're selling directly in, and we've got 46 countries that we're, that we're distributing in. Uh, again, I would say that to be to be uh, frank about what we're doing in the U.S., we're really just launching as we speak. Uh, and we've been in uh, a handful of teaching institutions with, with uh, strong success over the last 12 to 15 months. In terms of our heart and lung um, therapy system, you know, uh, compliance uh, has me focused as it should be on, on speaking to our indication. Uh, and we are indicated, I'll, I'll just read this, we're, we're indicated for long-term over six hours respiratory cardiopulmonary support that provides assisted ex, uh, ECMO in, in physiologic gas exchange of the patient's blood in adults with acute respiratory failure or acute cardio, cardiopulmonary failure where other available treatment options have failed. Uh, so as we look at, at where other clinical opportunities, clinical treatment opportunities have failed. Um, th this is where uh, our, our approval is focused on. And we're proud of this clearance. We're proud of, of being the only clear device with over six hours of, um, of treatment. In terms of, of a flavor for what the product is, I wanted to, to tee up a video. And then uh, it's less than 90 sec uh, seconds, so I, I think it'll be right to the point. But this provides you a, a real clear overview of, this, of the Nova Lung product. It's time to go further. Fresenius Medical Care is the trusted global leader in renal care. Now, we're taking our commitment to patient health even further with Novalung, the first extracorporeal membrane oxygenation system cleared for use for more than six hours. The Novalung system is an extracorporeal life support system that provides extracorporeal circulation and physiologic gas exchange for patients with acute respiratory failure and acute cardiopulmonary failure, providing a new option where conventional treatments have failed. Novalung offers a single integrated heart and lung therapy platform. The system is focused on supporting critical patient care, reducing the need for intubation, allowing mobilization, improving survival for patients in cardiac arrest, and impacting post-operative recovery. Novalung features innovative technology. A powerful membrane lung provides gas exchange and hemocompatibility for long-term applications. Integrated pressure sensors enhance safety due to the elimination of pressure measurement lines and an intuitive touchscreen, hot swappable battery packs, and a central sensor box create a single, fully integrated system. Insist on safety. Deliver accuracy. Provide new treatment options for your most critical patients. It's time. Choose Novalung. I know that felt like a bit of a commercial, but I, I, I wanted to just underscore a, a couple of points. And, and we are proud of our safety profile. And, and as perfusionists and ECMO specialists uh, in the audience and at this meeting, that there's there's two elements that that um, we we believe may make your job a bit easier. That's that's the those are the pressure sensors number one, 
um, which, which I know are available in, in other devices. But we've got uh, highly accurate pressure sensors and, and easy to read readings on our screen. So you can get a clear idea of, of when failure or clotting uh, is, is happening in the oxygenator. Separate uh, of, those, of those pressure sensors and separate uh, of, the, of the assessment of the oxygenator is, uh, is the assessment of our pump. Our pump head has a, a pump index that measures power. And, and over the course of the treatment, uh, failure can happen through a number of, of avenues. Uh, when I say failure, I mean the, 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 the therapy either becoming less efficient or stopping. The first is the, oxygen, uh, the oxygenator, if that's a culprit. Uh, and the second is the, uh, is the pump head. And if the pump head is working too hard and pumping too hard um, and, and, uh, and you're not getting the results you need, we've got a graph that shows that as well. So that, that gives a clear indication of, of when the pump head may need to be changed. While that doesn't happen uh, all, that, all that frequently, it's a safety measure that we're, that we're proud of. And you might have noticed the second pump head in our system. A second pump head is a, is a backup, uh, so no hand cranking. And we've got um, two backup battery supports. So uh, our ability to, to have uh, safety measures to measure pressure and to measure the, how hard the pump is working uh, are, are uh, allies that as care providers, uh, perfusionists and ECMO specialists, um, we, hope you, um, we hope you find valuable. Of course, we're always looking to, to develop and as the leader of product management and product development, I, I'm looking forward to continuing the, the pipeline of, of products in the future. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Chris. Our next speaker is Leva Nova, Larry Petrie. Senior Marketing Manager, Larry. Thank you, Carla, for the introduction, and I appreciate you notice that I am not Elizabeth Martin. Her name is in the agenda, and it was left over from last year. Uh, she gave our talk, um, so I'll be carrying that on today and hopefully do as good of a job as Liz did for us last year. Uh, many of you are familiar with Levanova because of the products that you use, but you may not be familiar with all of the different products we use or the company uh, in whole. We are nearly a billion dollar company in terms of sales. In fact, we're about as close as you can get to that without going over the line. We look forward to, to doing that. Um, our focus every day is to improve the quality of patients' lives. Uh, we do that by targeting underserved uh, markets in the med device space and looking for those areas that are gonna grow where we can participate. And we have strong positions in uh, advanced uh, circulatory support, also known as ECMO, uh, cardiopulmonary, which most of you are familiar with, and then uh, neuromodulation as well. If you look at a breakdown of our sales from uh, last year, uh, what you'll notice is that we're pretty well balanced between the extracorporeal space and the neuromodulation space. Uh, that gives us a, a, a great synergy between the two uh, and the ability to build in both platforms. Uh, we also uh, were able to achieve a 17% increase in sales last year, uh, which given all the present challenges that we face, uh, we were quite pleased with and we look forward to that growth continuing. Most of the products that you are familiar with are uh, in the perfusion space, uh, and that includes the S5 heart-lung machine, um, which uh, controls a, a really large portion of the market share worldwide uh, and builds on 40 years of experience uh, with heart-lung machines. 
the Inspire Oxygenator, um, which has crossed the, the threshold for 2 million patients treated, and very soon we'll be crossing the 3 million threshold. And then the extra auto transfusion system, uh, which treats over a half a million patients a year. Uh, so that's the platform most of you in the perfusion space are familiar with. Um, we build on nearly a half a century of experience in life-sustaining technologies, going all the way back to the Stockert pump, uh, which uh, was originally introduced in 1973, and then the S5 pump, which came out in 1994, a very long list of oxygenators that all represent incremental improvements to oxygenator design, uh, leading into the Inspire family, which we distribute today, along with the S5 that I mentioned earlier. In 2015, Soren merged with Cyberonics, and that's how Levanova uh, came to be. And we continue that innovation, and with the rest of the time that I have, I want to spend a little bit of time uh, showing you what might be in the, in the future for, uh, for you that we can offer. Um, the first one is an innovation on the S5 platform, uh, which we call the S5 Hybrid. Um, it's hybrid because it's a smaller footprint. It's designed to fit into operating rooms where uh, floor space may be at a premium, and it's 20%, 27% smaller uh, than the S5. It also takes up a little bit of a different form factor uh, in terms of having a wider footprint than the SCPC did, uh, which makes it much easier to maneuver into these smaller spaces. The S5 hybrid also can be used with many of the optional accessories that many of you are familiar with, uh, with the S5. That includes uh, multi-display control panels, our new blood gas system called BCAPTA. Uh, we have new alarm software that has been upgraded to match new standards and help you better manage cases, uh, along with the ability to do either base or mass mounted pumps. We are also very, very pleased to introduce at this meeting and a couple weeks ago at AMSECT, uh, the Essence uh, Perfusion Patient Monitor, which represents a new generation of, of our development uh, in this space. Um, in developing a perfusion monitor and an electronic uh, medical records platform, the first thing you think about is the clinical needs for it. And that was primary in our focus. And what we're able to do is, with this system, reduce the time that you spend on manual entry and remove some of the guesswork around interpreting um, the data that comes out. Um, we also want to pay attention to helping advance patient care. And we do that through some quality indicator improvements that I'll go into in just a minute, and then also the addition of the goal-directed perfusion uh, monitor built into the system. But these are just the in the OR aspects. There's other aspects we have to consider when we develop a system like this as well. All of you have had interactions with your IT department and you know some of the challenges and some of the uh, appropriate concerns and restrictions that they put on these systems. We've given that a lot of, bit, a lot of thought on how we interact and how we com comply um, with those requirements. We've also considered the people that are actually purchasing and maintaining the systems, and we have a variety of different ways to uh, provide uh, service level agreements that fit in with your program needs. Taking a closer look at the Essence Patient Monitor quality indicators, uh, we spent a lot of time optimizing that system from our prior experience. Perfusionists can now set desired reference times for their quality indicators. Um, you can set thresholds for different parameters or of interest, and then uh, that threshold management list is available throughout the case. Um, if it's exceeded or you go outside one of those parameters, on the display that number turns orange. Um, so it's the right amount, we believe, of catching your attention without being intrusive to let you know that that parameter has been exceeded. And then we've also added some calculations that were uh, commonly requested for things like area and time under a curve uh, for a given parameter. My favorite uh, feature on the perfusion monitor is the addition of the goal-directed perfusion uh, graphic user interface. Um, so you're able to view both in a table format and in a graphic format um, how you're doing against goal-directed perfusion parameters that you set up into the system that again work well with your practice. Uh, this is going to be available on, uh, on every case uh, that the Essence uh, uh, Perfusion Monitor is used, um, and you'll be able to, again, customize it to the way, you, way you'd like to see it. 
Uh, we have the uh, essence perfusion monitor here with us. It will be available in the exhibit hall uh, when this session ends. So if you're interested in seeing more, uh, touching it, uh, seeing how it looks, uh, come by our booth. We'll be happy to show that to you. I also want to draw attention to the LifeSpark platform, uh, which is our ACS platform. It's built on 20 years of life support experience uh, uh, through Tandem Life, and it provides up to five to six liters per minute of flow uh, when you're using peripheral cantillation, and it is the only pump uh, that can go up into the sterile field and does not require an infusion line. Uh, we've had a great deal of success with this. Uh, this is also available in our booth to uh, to take a look at. It's a very simple uh, system. If you haven't had a chance to uh, come up and play with it, it's something that you can learn uh, very, very quickly, very easily, fits into a lot of different practices and helps fulfill our goal for treating more patients in more places. The LifeSpark system is also uh, available on a variety of platforms, depending on your support. Uh, so it fits well into traditional VA and VV ECMO. It also works well with RA and PA and LA and FA bypass. Um, so again, come by the booth and you can have a chance to look at it. We're also hosting an event tomorrow afternoon uh, in the garden room and we'll have a workshop where you can uh, get a little bit more hands-on with that. So with that, Carla, I will say thank you and be happy to take uh, questions online as they come in. I know that we're getting a lot of questions about products coming in through our, our portal. So all of the sales reps are going to be going back, looking through this. So all the questions that you've been asking will be answered uh, probably either later tonight or tomorrow. So be on the lookout. If they're not answered and you want the need more information, then please just contact me um, privately or personally or through email, text or however, and I'll make sure I get the information for you. Our next speaker is Bill Nakotra. He is the medical science liaison for Essential Pharmaceuticals. Bill? All right, thank you, Carla, and uh, again, thank you, Perfusion.com. Sanibel has always been a great meeting, and it continues to be that again this year. Um, so I'm Bill Nicotra. I'm with uh, Central Pharmaceuticals, as, as was just mentioned. Um, I'm their medical science liaison and perfusionist, um, so I have clinical experience with custodial many years, and so I'm here to pass on uh, some of that experience uh, to you. So today I wanted to talk about what's new with custodial HTK. Um, we have new protocols. Um, I'm gonna ask the audience a quick question, just raising your hands. How many perfusionists in the audience has ever had to make a decision on giving a redose, whether it should be a high K, low K, no K? I'm sure everybody in the audience is, yep, hands are going up, for sure. Um, wouldn't it be nice to have a studied protocol that works every time and you don't have to make those decisions. That's the goal. That was the goal of putting together new protocols that could take care of all the patient populations uh, that we see in the, uh, in the clinical practice. So I'm going to go over these, these protocols and then I welcome any and all clinical questions uh, about this. So for years, Custodial HTK, we used this standard protocol. This was the gold standard of, of Custodial, um, and it still is. It does a, a fantastic uh, job of protecting the heart. And so the standard protocol, or for 
any cases that you would expect cross clamp times of greater than 60 minutes. So we're talking concomitant cases, you know, valve cabbage, redos, you know, these type of cases that uh, we know for sure are going to have cross clamp times of uh, two hours or more. And the protocol hasn't changed in many years for this. Um, I'm going to go over this. This is the protocol that's listed on perfusion.com. So if you need a copy of this particular protocol, it's easy to, to pull off of their uh, website. But custodial, if you don't know, needs to be refrigerated, but it has a one-year shelf life. So you hardly ever throw away custodial as you may have to do with some of your ad mi mixed uh, formularies. And then any standard ratio kit can be used. You can use whatever you're currently using to deliver cardioplegia, so there's really no capital upfront cost to start using custodial HDK. And it has to be delivered at three to four degrees centigrade. And 20 mils per kilo is the pediatric dose, so I typically use this um, protocol whenever I've got a patient that's 60 kilos or less or um, they're coming in with a, a very low crit. And then it has to be given for up to two liters for the uh, full initial dose. And then if you need a subsequent dose, it's half of whatever your loading dose was. And that's going to provide you with two hours of uninterrupted protection. So that one dose of custodial HDK is going to provide protection for two hours, up to two hours of ischemic time. And so the surgeon just has that entire uninterrupted time to perform their repair. And you give it just like you give any other cardioplegia in the beginning, enough to close the aortic valve. And then as soon as you start to get to a rest, you back off and you give it about 80 mils of uh, mercury, which is usually a retrograde rate. So typically you'll be delivering the rest of the dose a retrograde rate. And in bold is, it's more important that the time is, uh, is delivered over five to six minutes and not the actual total volume because we want to make sure that that sodium is depleted um, so that there is no action potential and that heart stays arrested for that entire time. And common sense, make sure that you have good, good drainage and you're not distended and, the, you know, um, so that you get really good uniform delivery of, the, uh, of custodial. And then, like I said, up to two hours of uh, uninterrupted repair time before you'll need an extra dose. So if you give three doses of custodial HTK for a procedure, you're in a really tough case. I mean, it's, it's a big case. But, you know, if you can't vent or sequester that volume, then sometimes hemoconcentration is necessary. So. so what were the benefits when I was practicing using Custo HTK? The low viscosity. Um, it was talked about today at, at lunch about the question about viscosity and distribution of uh, cardioplegia and so with this is the viscosity of water you, you have no distribution issues you actually get to the microvasculature and and that heart is is very cold and it doesn't hardly have any potassium in it so you're not going to have that high potassium load and you're not going to have to deal with typically k's of you know seven eight nine and having to figure out how to uh to take care of that and it's got superior buffering capacity to any other cardioplegia on the market. It is the only cardioplegia available in the United States that has histidine. And we all know histidine is a powerful amino acid buffer, and it'll buffer that pH in the anaerobic environment for an extended period of time. And that's why you can literally go two hours with a full dose of custodial. And really, for the high-dose protocol, just one recognized protocol. So no matter what institution you go to, if they're using custodial, they're doing the same protocol that another hospital's doing because there literally is only one protocol. And so there's no confusion. Um, and I think that when there's no confusion and you're all on the same page and it's been studied, you, you should expect better outcomes. And no additives. It's, there's no compounding. So if you've got an emergency case, you run to the refrigerator, grab a bag of custodial, and you're on your way. You're, um, sometimes you don't need retrograde because of that um, even distribution and that length of time of delivering. And also, we have a cold agglutin protocol. 
So if you've got a patient that has cold agglutins, you can actually protect the heart with temperature and not just try and give, you know, tepid cardioplegia and, and hope for the best. You can actually protect the heart with cold cardioplegia. So those are some of the benefits that I saw when I utilized it. But here's what's new. Here's the low, pro, low dose protocol. And um, Dr. Gnaiden was, if you saw the Wednesday talk, um, and if you haven't, I, I would recommend going back and taking a look at it since it's available. You know, he came up with this low dose protocol because of COVID and um, having to change techniques. And what he found with this low dose protocol is that for cases that were one hour or less expected cross clamp time, he could give half the loading dose. He could give up to one liter of custodial for expected cross clamp times of less than an hour. And he would give it at this, the same typical rate that you would with the high dose protocol. So at four degrees centigrade, um, 10, 10 mmOs per kilo, and then um, uh, at, a, at a retrograde rate of 100 to, uh, you know, 80 to 100 millimeters of mercury. So it would afford him up to 60 minutes of ischemic time before he would need to redose. And typically, um, if he was used doing a cabbage patient, he would take a third of that dose and give it retrograde just to make sure that he gave the heart really good protection. And then if, a, if we went over 60 minutes and he knew it was gonna be a little bit longer, then he would just go ahead and repeat the initial dose. So give another liter if, if you know you're gonna be a, a little bit more. So if, you, if it does end up rolling over, then it, it's almost like you know, giving the full, the full dose. And so what were the benefits? What were the reasons to consider doing this for some of the patients? Well, in single dose techniques, which are very popular um, right now, we believe that you get better long-term outcomes with, with a single dose technique of you know, less than 60 minutes. Obviously, now that you're reducing the total volume from two liters down to one liter, you're gonna have reduced hemodilution. I mean, common sense there, but the hyponatremia mostly wasn't uh, evident anymore. Sometimes, um, you know, it wasn't even noticeable. So that's that definite benefit to this. And, you know, they didn't use hemoconcentrators for any of the cases that he, he ran these. I think it was, and he'll, I have to refer back to uh, his paper, but I believe 90% of the patients that he did somewhere around there, he didn't use a hemoconcentrator when he used this protocol. The caveat is, and that's why I have it highlighted is, Obviously, there's a higher propensity to redose because now you don't have that two hours of protection. You've pulled it back down to one hour. So if you do get stuck or things happen, you, you might have to give a redose. And if you saw his talk, you'll know that there is some concerns about redosing. The, uh, the questions have not been answered yet about the effects of redosing and, and long-term outcomes. And then started to take a look at modified custodial. And this is something really new. We um, just started uh, putting this, implementing this into practice. And this is basically um, adding one part blood to four parts uh, crystalloid. So we have a modified Del Nido. And for the, I mean, for modified HTK. And for this, we give it the exact same way as we gave for the low dose protocol. We give it four to, four to eight degrees centigrade up to one liter and the same rate. And if it's a cabbage, a third of it in the retrograde cannula and redosing, same thing. Repeat the in induction dose. So why, why even talk about adding blood to a crystalloid solution that's tried and true, that has reproducible results? Well, here's the reason. Because now we have a direct comparison to Del Nido, you can now do a prospective study. Go up against the original Del Nido formula and go ahead and try it. See what you get. Because I can tell you there's no studies out there currently that are looking at custodial versus Del Nido. They're just not. Now you can do it at your institution. We're already doing it right now. And Here's an example of some of the data you can start collecting when you're looking at now 
you know, one-to-one, -one, apples to apples, modified custodial to modified Del Nido. So here it is, it's coming, and there's more data. This is early data, so um, all the numbers aren't in yet, and this likely will be published when we do have all the data in, but here you go, there's an opportunity to start actually measuring outcomes. And here's something that I've heard in the field for many years, is that I don't use custodial for cabbage patients because you know, you're using a 100% crystalloid solution and it can bleach out the heart. And surgeons can have a, a difficulty tracking some of, the, uh, some of the coronaries and where they actually need to uh, do their anastomosis and then whenever they do uh, a vein graft, being able to test with just pure crystalloid. They like to have that, that blood so that they can actually see the distribution of the crystalloid because if you're giving straight crystalloid into a vein graph, um, you can't tell if it's penetrating where, where you want it to be penetrating, but with a little bit of blood, now it makes it, the visualization so much better. And so we're hearing it, and so now that's uh, something that, now you can use custodial for every case, valves, cabbages, aneurysms, et cetera. So a lot of cool things are happening. Um, here's my email address. So. If you do have questions, you want to hear more about this, um, I'm definitely easy to get a hold of, and I appreciate your time, and I'll take any questions if, if there is a quick question now. You said that the protocols were on perfusion.com. Is the cold agglutinin protocol that you do on perfusion.com as well? No, and that's a, that's a good point. I, we should probably discuss that. You have because, people requesting that? Yes, um, okay. they can contact me. I will give you my protocol that I used personally, and it's, it works very well. Great question. Thank you, Bill. Our next speaker is Hemasonics. We're going to have Jeff Light, who is the senior product manager. Jeff? Hi, everyone. I think it's getting close to wrap up. Um, happy to be here. I'm Jeff Light. I can take these off because I don't have my notes, so we'll just go with the flow. Um, great. So, Jeff Light with uh, Hemasonics. Thank you guys for sticking around and listening. 
coagulation is dynamic. This is the title slide. Um, what, what we need here is, is fast, um, effective, and accessible tools to make informed decisions in bleeding management. Um, there's been a bit of a shift, uh, and you heard about it a little bit yesterday, uh, in terms of the awareness in patient blood management. Uh, this came out from uh, WHO last year, uh, this urgent policy brief of this need to implement patient blood management. I think a lot of you saw it yesterday. Uh, but essentially, it, it defines patient blood management. And, and the interesting piece, I think, about it is it starts language that uh, is talking about patient blood management in terms of the patient and not the blood product. Um, and, and it defines it as, is the broad concept uh, of not just focusing on decreasing blood product use, but improving transfusion decisions when clinically indicated. And I think that's interesting and also goes on to say PBM decreases risk for adverse outcomes in the iron deficient, uh, anemic, and coagulopathic or bleeding patient. Um, further last uh, month, actually, so this came out, and, and I actually really did enjoy this paper, this short paper by a series of, uh, of authors, or a long series of authors you can see, and they gave both a, a professional and a public definition of patient blood management. The important thing I think about this is that it's a global alignment of a, a concept or a definition of patient blood management, and it's globally aligned among perfusionists, perfusion groups, anesthesia groups, uh, patient blood conservation groups, patient blood management groups, uh, nursing, pathology, laboratory, hematology, et cetera. And again, they provided a not only a private uh, healthcare professional definition, but also a public definition. And that says something as well. I think what it says is that the concept of patient blood management is, uh, is transcending the Jehovah's Witness and, and, and entering the public domain, and right? So the, the concept and the drive to be uh, exposed to less uh, blood product is going to be driven not only by the hospital, uh, but also by the, the patient community as well as we move on, move forward in the world. Uh, and so that PBM, that PBM cultural shift is really uh, transitioning from blood transfusion and blood component uh, focused, which is product-centered, uh, you know, very hard cost-centered, very product-centered, uh, conserve what's on the shelf, to uh, a patient blood management focused uh, and a patient-centered approach, which, as we know, uh, really needs to, you know, A, be uh, patient-centered, and B, uh, really has to be a team sport. So, um, there's, there's many people involved in a comprehensive patient blood management program. So moving back to coagulopathic bleeding, uh, some patients we know will bleed uh, and what can be done to prepare. I think the important thing first is to have alignment uh, across the team, right? So clinical and laboratory alignment uh, across the team and to have an open dialogue about the diagnostic tools that are available that might support that best, uh, best support that patient have a team discussion aimed at that, optimizing the goals. Talk about test timing, location, accessibility and interpretability, reliability and ease of use, support and training, efficiency, cost, value. And ultimately, the goal is to have effective, efficient, and timely treatment decisions to best support your patient's needs and your patient-centered PBM initiative. So all of that aside and the, the, the rough start, um, hemisonics. Uh, from uh, the University of Virginia came the, this device called the Quantra. Uh, it was created there in an incubator program. Actually, the inventor and founder is still with the company as our CSO. Uh, it's headquartered in Charlottesville, Virginia, but really the base of operations is in uh, Durham, North Carolina, where everything happens. Um, we affiliated with Diagnostic Astago, in 2017, achieved CE mark in 2017 for the Quantra and the Q-plus cartridge, and then in 2019 for the Q-stat cartridge, uh, another cartridge, and then uh, received FDA clearance, de novo marketing authorization in 2019 with the Q-plus for cardiac and major orthopedic. 
Uh, and then uh, we've achieved about 100 employees worldwide, and we're expanding global clinical partners throughout the USA, Europe, and Asia uh, every day. So that's Hemasonics. Uh, that's what we are and uh, what we do. Um, why, though, why the Quantra? And so it really is designed to meet uh, the challenges of the both the clinical and the laboratory um, based on much feedback uh, and many, many years since viscoelastic testing uh, was invented, uh, 70 some odd years ago. Uh, and it was designed to meet the challenges that are inherent to classic viscoelastic testing te technologies, methodologies. Um, those being uh, an ease of operation and competency, really allowing for use at the point of care, uh, allowable by both laboratory and clinical and uh, allowing for that ease of operation. Uh, ease of interpreting results, really uh, aimed at increasing confidence, uh, improving communication across and between teams, uh, decreasing complexity in critical situations, uh, speed to actionable results from the blood draw, of course, and then you know, Quantra Q+, uh, it provides complete results in 12 and a half minutes, 15 minutes maximum. Uh, and it is, Quantra the, is the first viscoelastic test to be explicitly tested and indicated by the US FDA for use at the point of care. Uh, really quickly, 30 seconds is all it takes to run this test. I think you saw this yesterday. It is literally uh, a closed tube sample. Scan, push it in, push it down, push start, and you have your results. Um, also, in terms of ease of use, ease of compliance, a little bit that will make your laboratory happy. Um, two levels of liquid quality controls. Lyophil is liquid quality controls. Um, every single parameter is measured. Uh, this is just a, a look at what it, what it looks like. It looks like a little blood tube. So testing a control is actually just like testing a, uh, an actual sample. Uh, once it's prepared, you just push it down just as I showed you in the previous slide. Um, Real-time quality assurance, the internal, internal quality controls, again, another need uh, that every eight hours, uh, the system runs an internal quality control won't let you proceed if nothing, if something doesn't pass. Uh, this is another important piece that the laboratory will enjoy um, to help um, ensure that, that the test is going to output the correct result. Uh, again, enabling point of care use. So cartridge QC with every single test and at startup, um, and as I already mentioned, the liquid quality controls. So really the only thing in, in your hands as the clinical user uh, is to get the tube filled to the right level. It's completely closed tube and stick it into that cartridge and hit the start button. Uh, as you can see, Quantra Connectivity Solutions, uh, we have both remote view and drivers and middleware through all of the major players. Uh, but quickly, uh, talking now about interpretation and speed, uh, I just wanna draw your attention to the top left-hand side of the screen we're looking at that, that top row, and at the top left, we have CTH, as you can see. The top middle, we have CT, and the top right, we have CTR. Those are all of our clot initiation parameters, and what we're looking at there is we're looking at the combination of both the uh, initiation, meaning the upstream factors, or those that would be contributed to by those factors that would initiate clotting, ones you might find in P, uh, FFP or PCC, uh, and then also the influence of heparin, for example. Um, CTH is a heparin neutralized clotting time. So it is a clotting time in the absence of the effect of heparin. Clotting time in the middle is heparin sensitive. And then clotting time ratio, which is CTR, is really just one over the other, right? So clotting time ratio over 1.4 would indicate the likelihood of residual heparin, um, which is fairly helpful. Uh, to know post-protamine, especially if you're not using an HMS or low-level ACT, uh, as well as in ICU if uh, you suspect rebound. On the bottom, we're looking at clot stiffness parameters. Clot stiffness parameters across the bottom on the left, we have CS, that stands for clot stiffness, PCS, platelet clot uh, contribution to clot stiffness, and FCS, fibrinogen contribution to clot stiffness, they are what they sound like. Uh, clot stiffness is your total clot 
stiffness. It is uh, the platelets, the fibrinogen, the factor 13 cross-linked, uh, the whole kit and caboodle, if you will, uh, that makes up the clot. Uh, the platelet contribution to clot stiffness is, of course, that isolated but within the context of whole blood platelet contribution to the sample as it clots and the fibrinogen contribution to the sample as it clots. Uh, you can see the green reference ranges and the white arrows are pointing to the, uh, the area where the, 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 the clot has happened. If anything is out of range, uh, it will turn yellow. We did go through this yesterday. I think a lot of you just saw it already, but it can't hurt to look at it again. Of course, on the screens, if you're interested to look at the dynamics of the clot, you can take a look at the curves. And then on the right here, you can see that you can trend your patient over time. So if your patient is exposed to a treatment or if your patient is being tracked through, through the surgery and you want to see how they're progressing, how they're doing, in what direction perhaps some of those uh, uh, parameters are headed, uh, you can do that. So for example, you can see how your on-pump sample, your rewarm sample looks as compared to the baseline sample as compared to the post protobine sample or post intervention if that hopefully doesn't but sometimes does happen um you know interestingly enough coagulation as i mentioned in the beginning it is dynamic and reference ranges are great but reference ranges are based on normal healthy volunteers these people that are being tested with quantra are not normal healthy volunteers everyone starts in a different place Right, and some of us, you know, me and you and everyone in the room, we all have a different coagulation profile to start with. And, uh, and, and I may right now be falling in that normal reference range. I may not be, right? So it's important to know and look at that baseline and say, well, this is where the patient was when they weren't bleeding, okay? So it, it, it is interesting. And you can see in the trend screen, that green bar that kind of goes all the way across, that is the normal reference range. It's, it's a good cue, but in terms of positive, negative, I don't know that, that it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's an absolute. So that being said, I do want to talk a little bit now about speed. Why is that so important? Again, coagulation being dynamic. Well, the more blood you lose, the more factors lo you lose, the more you bleed out, the more you're treated, the dilutional co coagulopathy can happen, and the more factors are consumed, the worse things get, right? So say you have a bleeding patient at 300 mils per 30 minutes here. This is actually an excerpt from uh, Tanaka Bader from 2013, but it's a great example of, of what you can do with uh, a short test versus a long test for results. So here we have the lab sample sent and a borderline fibrinogen is reported from the lab at, oh, 90 minutes, 80, 90 minutes. And so cryo, it says borderline fibrinogen, let's get some cryo. Cryo is, the, is uh, thawed and taken and isn't actually uh, infused into the patient until 130 minutes later. So you can see what the fibrinogen level has done. It has gone from 100 mg per deciliter down to less than 60 mg per deciliter in that time frame. It's a long time to bleed. Versus if, for example, you have a point of care test and you can get results in less than 15 minutes from the draw, the sample can be sent and maybe 15 minutes later or so, well, if you have access to purified fibrinogen concentrate, you could make that decision. Uh, really 30 minutes, 20 to 30 minutes later, that could be, could be done and the patient has now, uh, their fibrinogen level has actually gone down from 100 to about 90, only 10 mg per deciliter. But, you know, as is mostly the case in the United States, we're using cryo. Um, and so you can see if, if that were the case, oh, my arrow's off, but you can, you can see there that at 80 um, mg per deciliter, you know, you've really lost about 20 mg per deciliter from where the lab sample was, would have been sent. And so the patient doesn't bleed as much, bottom line, right? Bottom line, patient doesn't bleed as much, is exposed to less product, and probably you're not chasing your tail uh, trying to get that resolved. Um, less... Uh, complicated, a little bit less stressful, and a little bit less risk. So 
moving on, you know, I think a lot of people do ask, you know, they s sort of see the Quantra, it's a black box, and it's like, what's going on in there? Uh, and it's kind of interesting. Um, it, it's based on a technology called SEER, uh, which stands for Sonic Estimation of Elasticity or via Resonance. Uh, Quantra is the only viscoelastic testing which is using uh, medical grade ultrasound to, uh, to test the sample. And it, it's actually because of that technology that Quantra is able to, to do what it does. Um, and that means able to test in a completely closed system with a completely closed tube. There's no exposure to air or moving parts or anything. In fact, the cartridge itself doesn't have any moving parts. Um, the sample's drawn up into, into a small well where in that well, um, an ultrasound pulse pings the sample, or it actually rings the sample like a bell. And every one second, uh, ultrasound hits that, ha hits that sample and, and listens to the clot basically change over time. Uh, what it's doing is it's directly measuring the shear modulus of that sample. It rings that bell, you know, in a completely closed system, and in a, it is hearing uh, the change. Um, so what shear modulus is, is an absolute property of all solid materials, like this podium, right, has a shear modulus. Uh, blood is a liquid. It has a shear modulus when it's a liquid. It has a shear modulus at every second of change as it transitions into a solid or a semi-solid um, viscoelastic material. The higher the mod modulus, the stiffer the material. And it is expressed on the Quantra in that scientific unit of a hectopascal. So it is directly measuring. And because of this, we can measure this. So we can do this very quickly. And we can also provide the um, range of parameters that are unique to Quantra. So that's it. Um, why Quantra? Again, it's a ease of operation and competency allowing for point of care, ease of interpretation, speed to actionable results, and uh, so forth. Thank you. I'm Jeff Light. There we go. Thank you, Jeff. Well, this concludes our, our session tonight. We want to thank everyone for joining us. At 6.30, we're going to have our soiree, which is sponsored by Perfusion.com. We hope all of you come by the booth, get your PDC swag. We have amazing new traveler package that we are offering to